Welcome to Minnesota Atheist Talk. I'm Grant Steves, your host, and my guest for this segment on Mormonism is Bjorn Watland. Mormonism has become an interesting topic in the sense that we have a candidate running for office for the presidency that is of Mormon faith. We want to look at the social standing of Mormons within our society today. We want to explore the area of recruitment of new members, and we want to look at how do you leave the Mormon church when you begin to discover that it is not what they claim to be. Bjorn has done a considerable amount of research, and he has been able to talk to many Mormons at his door. And based upon this knowledge, we've come to a point where Bjorn can really become an expert in talking about Mormons, and I welcome you to this segment on Mormonism, Bjorn. Thanks, Grant. The area of, of, of discussion that we want to open up with has to do with the Mormons and their expansion beyond the historical role to a more contemporary role. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to look just briefly at the political side of it because of Mr. Romney's entrance into the political race. Mm -hmm. How much do you know about the political involvement of Mormons mm -hmm. in this society? Well, Mormons are, are encouraged to be active members in their communities. So um, uh, one description of Mormons would be that they're patriotic. That's, that's definitely something that you could say about Mormons in general. And part of that patriotism and that, that active involvement in community is becoming an active member in your own government, your local government, being on school boards, city councils, governorships, um, uh, being in the, the Senate and Congress, there are about, I think, about 10 members of Congress who are uh, Mormons, uh, in addition to uh, Mitt Romney, who is running for president. So there are, there are plenty of Mormon members that are in Congress. Harry Reid is a Mormon. So this isn't something new that, no. uh, not, that um, the United States uh, federal government has, has, has seen many Mormons. Yes, we have Harry Reid, who, who is the head of the Democratic Caucus in the mm -hmm. Senate. We have the two senators from Utah that are mm -hmm. both, both uh, Mormons. We have a senator, at least one senator from the state of Idaho. Mm -hmm. So in, in a sense, they have, for their numbers, mm -hmm. they are overly represented Correct. within yep. the Senate and the Congress. Yep. And, and politically, they are a very active group. Mm -hmm. And it is important to understand some, I think, of the social issues. For example, the role of women within the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. Most people probably don't understand or know that, in, in a sense, they discriminate against women, don't they? Mm -hmm. What is the role as they perceive women within the church? Right. Looking at, looking at Mormonism from the outside, you could easily say that uh, women are... Um, are persecuted against, that their roles are strictly defined, and that they don't have as much freedom as they used to have, or as they, as they would have in a, outside of Mormonism. And that, that, would be, that would be accurate coming from the outside. They see it as a sense of duty, that people have set roles, that God ordains you to, um, for example, the, the men can have the priesthood authority. When you're uh, 12, you're allowed to have the, uh, hold the priesthood as, as a man. Women are forbidden from holding the priesthood authority. They're not allowed to, to have that role. That doesn't mean that they don't have a role in the church, but they don't have that priesthood authority. There's, there is kind of this, uh, this line where that's the, the only way to uh, get into the celestial kingdom is through your husband. Um, there's, there's this treatment of women as sort of second-class citizens, as, as a general um, sort of from the outside looking into to Mormon culture, there is still that, that sense passing through. They'll deny that up and down. They'll say women have just as much rights as men do. They have just as strong of a role um, in raising the family as men do. But there is sort of this, you know, um, 1950s sitcom ideal of what a good family is to Mormons, where you have the, the good homemaking mother and the wage-earning husband and many children running around that are all in the Boy Scouts or active in their, their communities. So they, they take 
not only do the women have a particular role within mm -hmm. their, their organization, a subservient role, but then if you look at the whole issue of marriage, marriage is a very important concept. Mm -hmm. Divorce is frowned upon. Right. So they... they well, divorce is, is frowned upon, but it's... It, divorce, divorce is frowned upon if you're a man divorcing your wife. A woman has to divorce her husband or um, un unseal herself from him in order to remarry. A man is not generally subjected to that same role because they have this doctrine of plural marriages, which was uh, is still a doctrine that holds true in the church, but isn't followed because it's against the law. Uh, uh, Willard Wood Woodruff in um, uh, uh, 1890 had a manifesto that basically got rid of the practice of polygamy among Mormons because the state of Utah was being formed and um, wouldn't be allowed to be a state if they were practicing this illegal activity of plural marriages. So they still hold that in the celestial kingdom where a government isn't ruling anything and there are no laws, that a man can be married to many wives. So you would never want to have a divorce, the man divorcing a wife inside of the temple because you're always allowed to have as many wives as you want to. There's no need for a divorce. So you're spiritually bound to your wife in uh, their version of heaven. So this is a very, very patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. how, There's a lot of does... mentions of, uh, of uh, uh, the Heavenly Father. Is That's who you pray to. You pray right. to Heavenly Father. There is a structure of Heavenly Mother, but you don't talk about Heavenly Mother. Okay. There's nothing mentioned about Heavenly Mother. I, when I, I, ax, I asked a, a Mormon last week about Heavenly Mother, I said, tell me about Heavenly Mother. And he said, well, we don't have any scripture about it. We have some songs about it. But if you really want to know about Heavenly Mother, you're going to have to ask Heavenly Father. Ah. <laughs> now, what about Heavenly Gay Child? <laughs> Heavenly Gay Child is non-existent in, in Mormon culture. That... You're, you, there's a, a strong focus on procreation. Even though you can be childless and be a Mormon, it is frowned upon that you're supposed to try to procreate have as many children as you can. You can't be gay and procreate. Well, you, you could adopt children, but uh, gay marriage, they, they, they do believe that you should you naturally procreate. Um, homosexuality is not uh, ordained in the Bible. There's, there's many statements... Uh, against it, that you should be stoned for, for being gay. They'll allow you to be gay and, and be a, a church member without a problem. You can even um, go to the temple, um, be a, a sort of a full-fledged Mormon member, but you can't practice homosexuality. You have to be celibate. And that's a choice that some people make. Some people lie to themselves and raise families, and then those families fall apart later when they are tired of lying to themselves. But that's a, that is definitely something that's in Mormon culture where there are no gay Mormons, essentially. If you're gay, you're just not a Mormon. You, you could be excommunicated. Um, you're always allowed to come back. You just have to say you won't practice that anymore. It's a, it's a sin just like, and it, just like, well, not just like drinking coffee or um, having a beer, but it's, it's something that they don't want you to do, and you have to uh, regret that you've done it and tell God that you're not going to do it again, establish that covenant, that agreement again, and then he can go back into the temple. But. So they, they're not going to look at the science, uh, that the possibility, for example, that, they're, they're, that, that gays, in fact, are not nurtured mm -hmm. in this way, or that it is a choice, mm -hmm. but rather that is, it's because of nature, because of mm -hmm. a genetic or a hereditary factor. Mm -hmm. This is something that would be rejected by the Mormon church at this point, wouldn't it be? It, it could be. Um, for, for certain Mormons, the distinction on whether it's nature versus nurture for homosexuality isn't important for them. It's the fact that you're, you're sinning and you need to stop it. It doesn't matter whether you're, you can't be straight. You could be celibate okay. or you can cure yourself of 
homosexuality, which is definitely something that they try to do. They try to cure people of, of homosexuality in the same way that they would want to you know, cure someone of alcoholism, you know, any, uh, any of the other vices that they, could, that they could think of that you shouldn't do. They have um, education. So it is possible that the prophet mm -hmm. in 2020 could all of a sudden say, homosexuals may be married within mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. Because the prophet has control, doesn't he? The prophet speaks, to, speaks with God. That's what the Mormons believe, that the, the prophet speaks with God. And when the prophet speaks, the prophet can speak as God. So everything that the prophet is saying is essentially what God is saying. So that is a possibility, I would imagine, that would be a very unlikely <laughs> possibility that that would happen. So they, they do have authority to change things, but that would be something that would go against some key elements in the Bible um, to them, how they would so interpret in, in, that. So in many respects, their view of sexuality, whether it's the role of women, gays, or men within, within mm -hmm. life, uh, are pretty traditional. Right, pretty... pretty um, um, within the Christian You'd, you'd, say, you'd say conservative. Conservative, yes. Right. That, that um, th they do believe in uh, no premarital sex, for example. A lot of families still follow the practice that if you're engaged to someone that you don't sleep in the same bed, that you, you could, you're even frowned upon if you live together and have separate bedrooms. So there is even, even that extreme. Um, so you don't have sex until you're married. You don't live together until you're married on your wedding day is the first time that you have sex with your fiance, probably. That's, that's an ultimate goal. It's just like with, uh, um, with Catholicism, no premarital sex. Uh, how many Catholics have premarital sex? And it's just that common. So there is this June Cleaver extreme that, that um, Mormons will idealize to, but in, in actual practice, you know, just like someone would sneak a Dr. Pepper, they could sneak premarital sex. <laughs> okay. Now, it, it, it seems to me that, that there's a denial of science within the area of sexuality. Mm -hmm. What about the yep. denial of science or their view of science when it comes to intelligent design mm -hmm. or the creation of the earth? Are they creationists or are they evolutionists? How do they view that part of science? There hasn't, there hasn't been strict doctrine about it, so there isn't, um, there isn't a general Mormon rule. All Mormons believe this, but there, there definitely is a push toward creationism. I actually spoke with a, a, a member of the Mormon church and was talking to him about humanism and that we believe in using scientific evidence in order to uh, reason and that he thought that that was all well and good and that he even talked to his son about you know using um, using your own reasoning in order to say that the teacher who was telling him that evolution which has all of this evidence that evolution isn't correct don't believe everything that your teacher is telling you because evolution doesn't have all the answers and that there's holes in the evolutionary theory and so if we look at the Bible we can see that the Bible is right and gives you all of the answers with without that you know that evidence because of the lack of evidence and holes that you perceive in the theory that this is the alternative and this must be right is is sort of a general attitude but there are people that learn genetics um, there are scientists that are Mormon Oh. That, that it's just like with, with um, Christianity that you could be a, a Christian and a biologist. Right. Your attitude of God's involvement in biology might be God touching a blip and causing the Big Bang and that you really don't believe God interacts in daily life, um, that type of okay. watchmaker philosophy. Now, with, within, within their school system and teaching of this, I, I, I could see that within Utah, they mm -hmm. certainly control the curriculum of the state of Utah. Mm -hmm. And where they have a majority of the population in a particular community, I would assume that the, the Mormons control the, the teachings mm -hmm. within that school. But in, in most of the public schools here, for example, in the state of Minnesota, where there, there are a number of Min the Mormons integrated into mm -hmm. the regular school, right. they do not have as such uh, a, a parochial school. Right. And therefore, they, they would have to accept 
it would seem, some of the teaching, but then go home and have mm -hmm. the, the truth declared mm -hmm. as to mm -hmm. what is proper science, right. according to the Mormons. Right. And that's, that's a difficult thing for young children to try to wrap their minds around. In Utah, they're, they, most children do go to um, public schools. There aren't a lot of people that go to private schools, private Mormon schools. They do have classes that, that exist near the school grounds, but for, far enough away to not violate church and state agreements, where students can take an elective called seminary, where they can go there and, and they learn about the Book of Mormon, the Pearls of Great Price, the, uh, you know, how, to, how to be a good Mormon. They can take these classes there and they're right, they're right nearby, but don't violate that, that church-state um, structure. But there is definitely a sense that if you take a course and you talk about this history of the earth being uh, billions of years old, or you talk about the archaeology of the uh, Americas, about in, in the um, indigenous people of the Americas coming over from Asia and then settling the um, Americas would contradict what the Book of Mormon states that the people, the indigenous people of the Americas were really descendants right. from Jews in Jerusalem from 590 BC. That, that would completely contradict that. There's all of the, the Book of Mormon is full of very large cities, established uh, metalworking, and uh, they, they made many weapons. You would find evidence of these, these weapons somewhere if, if, there, if it was really true. You, you can't build a giant city without having rubble. And some people do think that the uh, Aztec ruins in Latin America are, that's evidence of these early Mormon mm -hmm structures. Well, that, that's interesting, and, at least in terms of their, their understanding of science and archaeology. They, they, I think they control within the, in the state of Utah, but when it comes to Brigham Young University, which mm -hmm. is, is sort of their premier mm -hmm. Mormon university, this is not a public institution. This right. is a private institution, right. which essentially educates their very elite, mm -hmm. and there they clearly teach mm -hmm. within the doctrine of the church. Mm -hmm. So in other words, their notion of the archaeology of the United States mm -hmm. is the Mormon and not right. secular. Right. And there then there is serious effort by Mormons to find this archaeology. They they scientifically want to find evidence of these villages. So this means that they must, as as we noted in an earlier segment on the Mormons, they must manipulate and distort evidence mm -hmm. to prove their point mm -hmm. and it doesn't it could not coincide with mm -hmm. secular right and at some point they have to clash how do how do they work with the clash between that which is secular and that which is religious well they the religious teaching always trumps the secular teaching that they can justify it any way that they want to when God is involved. And so they can say, well, God made it look like this. What about the dinosaurs? Well, God made, God put the bones in the, the earth to confound you or to uh, test your faith. That this is, there's a lot of reasons to uh, believe that Mormonism is true. There's a lot of reasons to believe Mormonism isn't true and that uh, you're supposed to believe the things that that support Mormonism. So God is a trickster. He, he <laughs> plays tricks on us to see if we really have faith in him. Right. That, that's a curious notion of, of what this omnipotent God right. is supposed to be. Well, and there's a strong attitude that you're always supposed to be obedient to God. And so you would never, ever contemplate as, as an act of Mormon, or as, as, a, as an act being Mormon that that God doesn't exist. That would never cross your mind at all. That you're supposed to be obedient as a child to, uh, to so, the will of God. So if God says that the earth was created in six days, then the earth was created in six days. Or if God says, sacrifice your first son, mm -hmm. you sacrifice your if first son. If the prophet says that you shouldn't drink caffeine, then you don't drink caffeine or alcohol or smoke. Well, in April, 
as I understand now, mm -hmm. you were first recruited in a sense mm -hmm. to this and, and, and to the, the idea of, of, of Mormonism. Uh, at what age do these people go out to do their recruitment? Well, how old were these young men? Uh, they're, they're about 19, so it's, it's right after they're done with high school. So the, the process is that uh, these young men, once you're 12, if you're a male, you can uh, have the priesthood authority. You have to go through a temple ceremony, which kind of separates Mormonism from the rest of Christianity in that they have these temple endowment ceremonies, they have baptisms for the dead, sort of these Masonic traditions that... Um, that you you uh, you get your your authority, your priesthood authority. You end up you end up going on your mission after high school. You have to be you have to be uh, you have to have your priesthood authority in order to go. And the on missions mission. are about two years, Is right? They're two saying? years, so you're going from you know eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and then you're expected to go to college and you go to BYU for four years, and there you find your wife and you get married shortly thereafter, or you get married when you're in college. There's plenty of people that get married when they're in college. How effective is this, this recruitment ministry? Well, it, it isn't necessarily responsible for the, the total growth of, of Mormonism. I would say the, the biggest impact of, of Mormonism, or the, the biggest impact of the growth of Mormonism is recruiting families and having large families. A typical missionary may get two baptisms, they don't get a lot of baptisms, but it's it's something that's part of their tradition, so to, to so to speak. It's not cheap. The families have to spend about four hundred dollars per person to send them away for two years. So it's it's in, it's very expensive. Mormons are used to contributing a lot of their uh, money to the churches. They have a ten percent tithe. If you want to be a member in good standing, you have to give ten percent of your income to the church. So this is in addition to that ten percent. You have to give the the $400. The missionaries are given about $100 to use as food. So $100 in a month isn't very That's much nice. to, use, uh, to use for food. And the missionaries tend to find themselves on their missions. So typically for most people, they would end up going off to college, where if you were raised in a faith, a particular um, religion, you kind of lose that uh, right around that time. Um, for the Mormons, they become stronger in their faith in those okay. two years. So, according to statistics, they grow at about a 12 to 15 percent mm -hmm. rate. Those are their figures. Right. And as you said, that would include family. It would not necessarily include mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. people or exclude and separate out the people that are recruited from outside. Mm -hmm. Also, their outreach program in terms of beyond the United States is much more rapidly growing than in the United States, as I understand. Yep. There's, a, there's about 12 million members, um, 12 or 13 million. There's about 6 million in the United States. There's about 7 million worldwide. So there's actually more people. There's strong growth in Latin America. Right so how now. do you think people should respond to them at the door? <laughs> well, you, you don't have to be hostile. I mean, these, these, these kids are kind of doing what's expected of them. Granted, they can say no. I mean, you're 18, you're an adult. You can say, no, I don't want to. But that sort of brings shame to your whole family. It's a bragging right to say, oh, I had five children and all five of them served missions. To have a family and have no one serve missions is, is sort of frowned upon. So they do have a lot of family pressure. And to be able to stand up to your family like that when you're 18 is is rare. So a lot of these kids are doing what they're what they're expected to do. But that doesn't mean that when they come to my right. door, I have to be nice to them. Right. Well, you can say no thanks and then just leave. It, it could be an interesting experience if you want to hear their unique perspective on things. They they have a completely different theology than uh, than much of Christianity, even though they do believe in the Bible and Jesus and God. It is completely different. So if if you ever want to dive into the celestial kingdom, terrestrial kingdom, the outer darkness, they will, they'll tell you all about that. They probably won't tell you about all the temple ceremonies. Those are secret. Right. But. I, I could off, offer them a book on the Mormons, too, to Exposé of the Mormons or something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that. Oh, when when we, we get into the next stage, because I don't want to be recruited, mm -hmm. but I'd like to see some people leave, mm -hmm. Uh, what are some of the steps that you see, very briefly, mm -hmm. that could be done here? Uh, well, it's, like I, like I said, even for an 18-year-old, it's very difficult to, to step out of that realm, to, 
I'd say you're an atheist, for example, would be horrible um, to a Mormon family. You definitely wouldn't be um, wouldn't be welcomed at, at family events, depending on your family. But that's a general attitude: is that you wouldn't be you wouldn't be accepted. So, to to come out as an atheist, to really admit how you feel, to have these strong questions about Mormonism, about these contradictions, about archaeological evidence, about how you think it's all made up. There are nice parts in Mormonism. People are happy in it, but you feel like it's a lie. Um, there are a lot of people that find comfort on the internet. That's been a, a big boon for people that sort of are in these these tight communities where being really open about being an atheist is, it, well, it may be difficult even for the average person to say that they're an atheist in a community. It's It can be even worse for uh, such a tightly knit community that you find in Mormonism. There's one book that I would recommend. It's called The Handbook of Today's Religions. Now, although this was written by people of a very Christian faith, mm -hmm. it explores a variety of religions in terms of looking at their doctrines. And if you take an, ob an objective viewpoint of what is here, you can sort of compare what other religions believe. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, you begin to see why there are some differences between Mormons and Pentecostals and mm -hmm. Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witnesses and cr Christian scientists and all the rest, mm -hmm. and maybe act as a method of getting out of this mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. There's another book that I would like to plug at the same time. And I think ultimately for anyone that is in the Mormon church that wants to get out, to me it's a matter of critical thinking. And this is the seventh edition by Vincent Rogerio on Beyond Feelings, A Guide to Critical Thinking. He really looks at how you approach the thought process and trying to become objective about mm -hmm. things that you feel very strongly about mm -hmm. and moving on in, in, a, in a direction outside of, of, of a religious structure. Mm -hmm. The last book that I wanted to exhibit and, and plug is How We Believe by Michael Shermer. Mm -hmm. And Shermer is looking at the search for God in an age of science. He, he really traces all the steps that we take in, er, in order to develop a belief system mm -hmm. or change our belief system. Mm -hmm. And I strongly recommend those to people that are of the Mormon faith or, in fact, of any religious organization and they would like to get out of it. Uh, we, we haven't talked about how they treat the former members but undoubtedly, it is going to be a major step for anyone that leaves a, re leaves a particular religious organization. The tighter the organization, the more difficult it is going to be. Mm -hmm. But I can say for Bjorn and myself that it is a freeing experience to leave these organizations and become an atheist. We thank you for participation in this segment on the discussion of the Mormons. Minnesota Atheists welcome the audience to contact us contact us at the website or the phone as displayed upon the screen. For those who contact us, you'll have a free newsletter offered to you. Let us know some of the topics that you are interested in and would like us to explore. I want to thank you for listening to this segment, and if you're interested in us, we're interested in you.